I'll record him. Perfect. Yeah, we're good. Very good. Um, in fact, before before we get into it, Michael Coates says hello. I've just been speaking to him. Oh yeah, lovely. <laughs> He yeah. said, he, "He said you're not as much of a bell end as people make you out to be." <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. He said you're mega. And uh, Ash Fletcher for Ash Fletcher for enabling this one. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, no, Ash, Ash well, yeah, but I know Ash through obviously coming down to Imarsat and um, you know chatting to you guys about the next, the next challenge. So um, yeah, and actually Michael was my first ever podcast. Uh, it oh really? Like- yeah, yeah, see, yeah, but it's, it seems it's probably about eighteen months ago now, yeah, or even even longer, yeah. He's done a shed. He's done a shed load now, though, I bet. Uh, hey. He's done a shed load now, though, I bet. Oh yeah, he's, he's done a lot now. Yeah, it's one of his one of his early declassifieds. It was yeah, it was when he was so still. You. With... you, you've done a shed load now. Oh, I've done a shed. Yeah, yeah, I've done a few now. Yeah, yeah, but they, they vary actually. You know, like yourself, uh, declassified. Uh, mentors and military, more than military um, environment, but I do a lot, also a lot with the corporates. Uh, a lot of CEOs and uh, businesses also want to understand the mindset of just just the mindset of, of uh, people that achieve things as well. I mean, you've got the mental health aspect as well, so that, that opens up um, uh, another avenue regards podcasts. And then there's also the sporting world as well, you know, lessons learned you know, from what I've done and how they can, you know, introduce that into their sort of uh, practice as well. So, they, yeah, it's quite a diverse audience on my podcast. But, well, that, that's the thing, mate, is that when, when um, depending on, like, your, your background and experience in, in any industry or, or role, and we're talking about military, right, there's crossovers with the, with the experiences and, and everything. Like, so I've, I've started up another podcast, which is it's very structured, it's, and it's in series, it's, and it's around leadership. Yeah. Um, and sort of, for, I've done a pilot series, and it's it's called Leading Minds Podcast, or Leading Minds Leading Minds Series, it's called. Yeah. And the, uh, uh, but I interview successful leaders from a sporting background, yeah, a business background, or um, a military background, mm. and and uh, I, so I recorded the whole series before putting any out. And it's really interesting the similarities between yeah. the, the different the, 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 between the different qualities and things that you would think of a le- leader. Like one of the one of the uh, one of the one of the questions on there is I asked the person um, what's the what's the most important quality in a successful leader? Mm-hmm. And almost across the board, it's integrity or, yeah. or honesty. It's yeah. almost across the board across everyone. And it, and it, to be honest, it, I. I was expecting to there to be two or three qualities that would come up, but, but I wasn't expecting there to be one quality. It was almost straight across the board. Yeah, um, no. Inte- integrity is a, a massive one, but I think, I think you're right. I, did, I do a lot of guest speaking, and I was guest speaking last year uh, at an event, and it was the the topic was high performance teams. So you had Lawrence Delalio talking about the 2003 World Cup winning team. You then had me talking about. The special forces and you know what I then went on to do I mean you had then someone from the finance industry and they exactly I sat and watched them all obviously my own and then sat back and actually three diverse backgrounds but almost the the messaging was mirrored across the board it was just take just being um it was just different backgrounds you know and and, and uh, being delivered in in different arenas um, so yeah, you, you're right. It, 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 there's so many similarities. Um, I'm looking at potentially doing a a book, um, and I, I, I want to sort of sort of touch on that leadership. You know what the right team looks like. You know from the battlefield to the boardroom. Actually, what the decisions make on the battlefield are very similar to the ones that are made in boardrooms all the time. You know, obviously, you know some people would say to me, you know, obviously decisions you guys made in the battlefield must be you know, outweigh what we do. And I said, well, no, not really, because us, you know, as you know, being in a tight knit unit or team, you just need to protect the guys in your team. You need to make the right decision for, you know, six to eight guys that are around you. And their decisions in boardrooms will affect, you know, the whole business. And there's like, you know, they may have like thousands of employees. So, yeah, there, there are a lot of similarities. You know, obviously, yes, if we make the wrong decision, it could be fatal. Uh, you know, rather than losing millions of pounds, but 
you know, the pressure's, the pressure's still there. And, um, yeah, there's a lot of crossovers and parallels between um, the military and, and, and business. I just think we were subconsciously making decisions, which, you know, I think that's why we do really well in the corporate industry. There's a lot of transferable skills from what we've got from the military we can take into the corporate sector. What's interested me since since I've got into you know, the corporate commercial world is, and it, this is a big difference between the way the way uh, you achieve your objectives in the military, or uh, when I say I don't talk about the individual, I talk about a team, a, a unit, whatever size, uh, compared to the way that a civilian organisation will achieve their objectives or, or or plan their objectives. Yeah, they just don't seem to go into the detail. Of no. of uh, the level of depth of detail and contingency planning or actions on as we call it, it just don't. Yeah. Or, most organisations don't. The really good organisations do, yeah. and they call it you know business continuity planning, business resilience. That's what it's called. It's just, and we have we have our mission, mm-hmm. right? And then our business continuity planning or disa- our built business, uh, disaster re- disaster recovery business resilience resilience is that section of the the tactical aid memoir, which is actions on <laughs> if this happens do this if this happens do this this is it and it, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, done but, you know, it's true yeah like when i do a lot of my presentations I, I talk about you know the meticulous planning in detail that go in into it and then as you very rightly touched on you look at every potential scenario or actions on i mean you have a contingency plan and a, and a tertiary plan but also what um what was uh, unique about those from the, the forces is the fact that we're very, you know, you can have the best plan in the world, doesn't f- survive first contact. You know, you have your start point, you have your objective, but it, you're very lucky if it goes to plan. You know, things never go to plan. And what we're quite good at in the military is being able to react to the situation uh, on the ground. And I think that's where the corporates struggle a bit, is they, like that, they have their start point objective. It doesn't go to plan. They're almost looking to see who to blame rather than how are we still going to achieve the objective? Uh, and I think that's the skill sets that we bring to the corporate world, which are, are unique. Um, like I said, the military is uh, is a business at the end of the day. The military is a business. But there is no business out there which replicates the experiences that you get in, in the military. However much money you want to throw at it, you will never ex- have those same experiences. So when you come out the other end, you know, you've got so many experiences that, those in the corporate world will never, you know, um, encounter. And, you know, I heard a good phrase from a friend from um, Gaz Bamford. You, you can't be experienced without experiences. Um, and I think that's why we do so well when we come into the corporate world is because we're like, ah, right, what's the problem? You know, uh, oh, we need to achieve this. Well, okay, how are we going to get there? So, yeah, there's a lot of, yes, we don't have degrees uh, and things like that, but we are good at problem solving. Mm, definitely. Do, do you know what I've just realised while you were talking? You know, before the podcast, I said you sounded really quiet. Yeah. I had the volume turned down on my headphones, mate. <laughs> <laughs> just, you know, you're booming through. <laughs> All right, I'll stop shouting now, isn't it? <laughs> Good to go. Oh, really. um, question for you: When you're doing the, when you're doing your talks and you're doing your podcasts and and are you, are you doing stuff that's got a, when you've been asked to speak and it's got a name to it. Mm. Uh, like my company, one I'm trying to do this with my company, high performance culture, or all other things. How do you, how do you keep your stuff fresh? Are you delivering more or less the same thing every time and tweaking it, or are you you? How, how are you doing it? I'm just interested because yeah, I've done a, so, I've done a few. Um, yeah, so for me, or when I, when, it, when someone uh, comes to me, all all. The, I have a story, I have a start point and, and an end. And, you know, if, if you don't know me, as in like the, the audience don't know me, they're, they're fascinated. You know, sometimes I go to these guest speaking events and it's like double world record holder cyclist. I'm that boring. You know what I mean? And then when you actually then get up there and then start talking about burying weapons on the black market and evacuating people are like, ah, hang on, this wasn't the story I, I, I expected. So I like to tell the story as near damn it from start to finish. But what I do when I speak to the corporates, the, the great thing about my story is there's, there's actually so many takeaway points um, that even if you just did that, 
they, they would be happy for that. But as you've touched on there, a lot of corporates or organisations want to focus on certain things, you know, resilience, you know, or whatever, or being the best that you can be. And so what I would do is I, I would then um, sort of elaborate on them, uh, especially when you go to these workshops. I like to, rather than just turn up, do my presentation and go, I like to spend the day with the organisation and understand you know, and hear some of the other speakers as well. I mean, you get, then you know then how to introduce that into your presentation um, as well. So I do a lot of research on the, the companies that I'm going to be delivering to. Um, for example, like uh, next week, I'm doing one for the NHS. And they're, they're obviously, I already know that they're conscious about the winter and the flu season and things like that. So I'm already putting that in into my presentation as well. So... I mean, that's, that's, that's what I tend to do. Um, I, still, I tell my story, but I then try and make it relatable uh, to the audience. Um, and, I, and I think that's, that's, that's how it's uh, so effective. Yeah, it's in, I think <clears throat> glad we're talking about it, actually, because there's a, there's a lot of people out there who you and I both know who would never, ever think, because, because they're, they're not a Dean Stott yeah. or they're not someone who's, you know, the, they're not sort of well known to be thrust, not being thrust. They're not well known, and they just see they don't see that they've done ever, anything valuable, right? Or they've got anything that sets them apart. Man, you and I probably both know hundreds of people. Like, but there was a guy. Um, there's a guy who joined. He didn't join up with me. Joined up after me. But he had a. I mean, he was dragged up. Re, I mean, a rough area of England. Dragged up. Um, he, he, he and he he found it hard when he was in initially. Um, and yeah. and he, he really struggled. He ended up leaving um, PTSD stuff like that. And, he, and and I ended up meeting up with him last year after several years, probably probably ten years, over ten years for him. And the guy was like a different person. I mean, the same rough, you know, real rough, like council estate guy yeah. who has stayed that way the whole way through. He sort of maintained because some people change as they go on and they and their accent changes yeah. and they and they just carry themselves a different. He's the same person, right? Really? But he's the same person he was then with mm-hmm. all his experiences. And he yeah. turned around and he and he asked me about um how to get into public speaking. And I, I was in inside when he asked it, I was beaming. I thought yeah. it's amazing because this guy has obviously seen other people doing it. Um, I'd mentioned it, but I did uh, my first one I did last year in London. But I'd mentioned that to him, and and the fact that he was asking about it and had the confidence to do it, I mm-hmm. thought this this person would be amazing to talk because he's he's and he's man he's covered in ta- he's covered in tats he's still got the ball dead like yourself right he's bit he's bit like a yeah but he's not as handsome as you <laughs> like, I mean he looks like he looks like a thug and he's always got a frown on him he looks like a thug and you would see I can just imagine it. A corporate would see him walking on stage and go, oh, you know. And he, he probably wouldn't have his tie done properly, you know, and all, all this stuff. And then he'd start talking. And again, the first 10 seconds, is that because of the way his accent is and the way his mannerisms are, I'd be like, whoa. But as soon as he got a few minutes in, they usually pin back because yeah. his, his experience, his background. Yeah, and, uh, and, and just going back to your point of, of relating things, it's spending time. I, think, I wonder how many speakers have that opinion of, Spending time with the audience beforehand. I was meant to be speaking in Santander in June, in June or last no May last uh, May, and they were having like a whole four days thing of innovation and innovation and something else. Yeah. I think it was. And I did the same thing as yourself. It was only a half hour talk on one day and a half hour talk on the next day. Okay. But I first off, I think innovation. I love that side of things. And in my sat of doing. It's at a similar thing going on. So I'd go and spend the day with Santa there and live from their stuff at the same time. Yeah. yeah. But also make it relatable. Because yeah. I get to the point when I talk, I'll know people's first names and then I'll know what they're trying to go and, and I'm learning in the process. It's yeah. interesting. I just was asking you because I'm wondering if I get to the point of yeah. would it get stale for me? how hard would it become to make it relatable and make it interesting? Yeah, but you're always you're always learning as well. So I'm always picking things up when I go to these events, I'm always learning things as well. And actually it's amazing how well received it is if you stay behind later. And the amount of people said, Oh, you know, they, they loved it because it also for me, I like to stay and then afterwards as well, because, you know, it's a bit like being in a school, school assembly, you're not going to put your hand up and ask questions, but later on. And also because when people see my presentation, I think afterwards they're just like, ah, you know, 
jaws hit the floor and they haven't really managed to um, digest what I've said. So later on, they then think, oh, actually, I'll, I'll ask him a question now. But that relatable one works. Like I said, I, I'm quite lucky that I, I can, um, it doesn't matter whether you're a member of the royal family or a kid on the, on the streets in, in the council estate, I will talk to you. You know, you don't get any preferential treatment with me, but I sort of know, you know, the levels of, of what, how to dress up and how to dress down. But I, I, I've done a, a, a couple with the Manchester United Foundation with the kids. And again, it, it worked in the opposite way. I was up there with my, my, my blazer and my trousers and shirt. And, you know, these hundred kids came in and you can see them. Ah, pff, got nothing in common with this geezer. Um, but actually, I went, I was in a homeless home in Moss Side in Manchester, the roughest estate in in Manchester in the 80s and you know that straight away as soon as I told him I started telling him stories about you've got them you know because there is something that they relate they can relate to you um so it works both ways as well yeah I've caught people out thinking oh this guy's posh you know and then all of a sudden you know you get your hero sleeves up your tattoos out and you just talk <laughs> to them right uh, so yeah no I can see where you man but I think you're right I think Anyone in the military could write a book, and you know we've got so many stories. It's just been able to, you know, to deliver it in a manner. And also, what are the takeaway points for them? You know, what I mean, what is it they're there to to hear, or what can they learn from you? So, yes, yeah. but I enjoy it. I enjoy it. Do you get um, do you get emotional at any any parts of your talk that you give? As in, as in, I mean, um, visibly. Um. Yeah, I think you do. It's a bit like my book. I narrated my book because I know when the important parts are in the story. You know what I mean? You, you know, like Stephen Fry, I think he narrates about 45% of the books or the audio books. But, you know, you know your story. You, you're passionate about those, those periods in your life where the, it was, you know, you were hurting or, you know, you were in pain or... You know, there was a disaster or something like that. So yeah, you you do. But I, 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 I'm very like I get told a lot is you're too humble. Like when I when I talk about certain things, it's almost like a throwaway comment. Like that, you know, and that's actually quite big. And you've just used it as a you know. I mean, so but I'm not an actor. You know, I mean, people. You know, there's, there's, there's some guest speakers will go to acting school and they'll really like you know sort of play on it, which which the audience like, but. For me, I'm just telling you my my story uh, from start to finish. Um, but yeah, you know, I do get told a few times of that. You know, I think you might be a bit too humble, but that's not a bad thing. You know, humility is you know again that's one of the ethoses of the special forces: integrity and humility. So um, you know, keep that line. Yeah. I, <clears throat> if we, I, I've, I reason I asked that question is I've there's been a, I've, I've done the same I've done I say the same talk the same kind of talk a couple yeah. of times now and a few times and i there's a part there's a couple of parts in it and i give a disclaimer at the start i said look sometime it's literally sometimes some of this can be a bit emotional for me sometimes it's not i've got no idea like i don't know and, <laughs> I, and I can't work out what it is it's like yeah, yeah. literally it's been one of them i did and it's going to start welling up but i have to take a second talk and it's like, geez, deep breath and then get back into it and other times <laughs> Do like a breeze. <laughs> trying, yeah. trying, to, well, I, trying to work out. Weird. I do a lot. Of, what I like as well about is is the Q and A sessions because it's amazing what questions they, they come out with and and they you know you know because when they when we do the Q and A sessions they'll probably I'll talk about something that's not even covered in that and that may you know start getting the emotions going um, yeah but I, I do enjoy Q and A but I have I've been to some events and the Q and A my my, my presentation is about forty five minutes the Q and A session has gone on longer. Um, but, but again, it depends on the audience. You know, whether it's a sporting background, they just want to get be intrigued in you know your training and everything else, and your your, your sort of mental resilience, or is it if it's the military? You know, you, you know, depending on the military, that you know, they'll probably ask about selection, something not even, even to do with your presentation <laughs> as well. Yeah. Um, you know, you've had a you know had, a, had an effect on them when they ask the questions got nothing to do with what you just talked about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right, mate. How do you? How are you feeling the time at the minute? What, what's your prep for the next challenge? So, so the next challenge is to uh, obviously kayak the River Nile uh, from source to sea. So my USP compared to other adventures and challenges, I like to take a sport I've never done before and find the biggest challenge. Obviously, with this situation we're in at the moment, it's global pandemic. That's pushed things to the right. If you look at anyone's challenges this year, everything's 
everything now is 2021. Um, so um, just trying to find something a bit closer closer to home. So we, I found a loop. It's called the Great Glen Loop, um, which has never been done before, never been kayak before, apparently. So you start in Inverness, you know, come yeah. down the east coast of Scotland to St. Andrews. You then come inland to Edinburgh, follow the Caledonian Canal out to the west coast and then back up. So you do like about 450 miles. So um, my mate who's, uh, who's coaching me, he's going he's gonna to come up uh, to Scotland at some point. We're just going to paddle that. So because it's a bit like the, the Pan American Highway, you know, 14,000 miles. You can never replicate that. You know, that was 15 Land's End John O'Groats back to back. So for me, I did a Land's, I did Land's End John O'Groats twice. Um, but you're never going to be able to replicate until the day of the race. And it's a bit like the Nile. You're not going to find anything as big as that. So that will be the big, the big one. Because it, all you need to do is test yourself, um, uh, you know, day after day. You know, it's easy to do it, a hard session on the bike or a hard session paddling and then rest for two days. But it's doing it day after day after day. And that's, that's where that challenge will be quite good, good in, in preparation. But again, with the, with the bike ride, unlike the bike ride, which was very much CV, it was fitness, um, kayaking's technique. Um, so fitness, fitness will be an element of it, but it's actually um, technique. So the sooner I get out there and start paddling, uh, the better. So I'm, I'm just, just looking forward to get, getting going with it. But with, with COVID, um, you know, we, we just don't know what the situation is in Africa. I've just heard recently they reckon it's just now got to Africa. I, I've no doubt it's been there for a while, but the Africans are very used to, they're used to, you know, disease and, and, and things like that. You know, that people dying from malaria and disease yeah, yeah. It's, it's commonplace over there, whereas the Western world is like a big shock. So I think Africans would deal with it a lot better um, than, than we have. So um, just monitor the situation and uh, see what happens. But we've got a, a documentary team coming with us as well. So it's going to be almost steered by them as well with the timelines. Yeah. South Africa's getting smashed by COVID, apparently. Uh, South, yeah. South Africa. It's South Africa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I've, got, I've got no doubt, yeah. They're... No. Um, they 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 step in because I've worked with my the team I work for they must at they're in they're in South Africa yeah they, their COVID uh, response measures defense measures are coming down they're easing them off right okay but there's they're still going they're still going up they're still accelerating in terms of infections and deaths going through the roof man yeah. man but <laughs> South Africa right <laughs> yeah yeah um, how for how so how long's the Uganda the uh, Uganda the uh, Nile trip. So the How Nile, far distance? distance. It's four thousand two hundred eighty miles. So the source is in Rwanda, which is just a spring, and then you've got Rwanda. Um, you know, you, you handrail Tanzania. You've got Uganda, South Sudan, Sudan, and then um, Egypt. Um, so it, you know, it's, it's a great thing. Unlike the, the bike ride, um, you know, that road, you just got to stay on the road. You know, you got to get there and and things like that. Whereas this. We've got other issues this time, you know, we've got wildlife, you've got crocodiles, you've got hippos, you've got, you know, disease, malaria, civil war in South Sudan. It's, it's a great project in the fact that um, I'm going to be reliant on a lot of the locals. You know, I won't be able to dictate what we do. It will be dictated um, by them. Um, but, it, yeah, it's going to be a great, a great, uh, great challenge. And I was surprised it had never been done before, you know, from source to sea. People have done stages of it but no one's actually actually gone from the source um to to the sea so it'll be a, it'll be a big one um how, how long do you anticipate paddling for each day it's a difficult one because <clears throat> the, with the pan american highway there was a world record that you you were aiming for and you had to beat so i had an objective i had a target to beat which was on, 100- on a daily on a daily basis on a daily basis, you know, I, I knew what my objective was to that day and actually, you know, smashed it. It was 117 days and did it in 99 days. And whereas this time, it's never been done before. So whatever I, I do would be the record. Um, but we're, we're probably not going to do it for a world record attempt this time, purely because on the bike ride, if you work with Guinness, uh, there's, there's lots of guidelines. There's lots of guidelines you've got to adhere to. Um, you know, collecting data and, and all those sort of things, which which is fine. But when you're on the road cycling, you're not going to have any real sort of issues. On it, when you're paddling the Nile, and that's everything from you know flat water to grade six waterfalls. 
you've got the wildlife, you've got the civil war, you're going to be, you're going to have to make certain decisions. You don't want to be steered by guidelines and then not making the wrong decision and put yourself at risk. So if you actually take the world record away, a, it's never been done before anyway, um, but you, you're, you're actually making making the right decision. But I am conscious as well that I'm still not paddling nine months later. You know what I mean? It's like, so I've got a, I've got a, a target in, in my head. You know, if I can do 40 miles a day, I'll, I'll be happy. But I do understand that there's going to be days where, especially the big white water stuff, is you're not going to cover much distance. But then there's going to be days where you're just flat and you're actually probably going to do 40 40 plus um so i'd like to you know sort of almost mirror the pan-american highway and do it in 100 days what are you gonna do about accommodation are you gonna organize accommodation are you gonna just camp yeah yeah so uh, as best possible we, we we will camp along the way yeah so there'll be my, myself uh i've got an on water uh on water support guy who's south african who knows the gnarly inside out but yeah we'll just camp we'll just we'll just camp where we can but apparently there's there's places Especially like Sudan. Apparently, I was chatting to Leveson Wood, who's obviously walked in ours. It's the same team that filmed his who will be coming with us. And, oh, cool. And he said, you know, they won't let you sleep by the, by the river because they're so hospitable. They'll have you in their house and they'll be feeding you up and things like that. But I always plan for worst case scenarios. I always plan that we will be camping and anything else would be a bonus. What about... Um... Is, is there any uh, terrorism you got to look out for along the way in any areas? Because yeah. there's some dodg there's some dodginess going on. Oh, there, it's Africa. There always is. But yeah, no, yeah. But you know, you've got the civil war. I say the civil war in South Sudan. There was a ceasefire a few weeks ago, which I, I, I was aware of. But we'll see how long that how long that lasts. But you know, you, you're going through Khartoum in Sudan. That's probably one of the most dangerous places as well for terrorism as well. So you, you know, you've got to almost be. But that's I think that's the thing I sort of. You know, being a, a, a security operator and having worked a lot in the security industry, that's a, that's an area I'm quite comfortable with. You know, it's a bit like the bike ride. We would cycle through, you know, Mexico and Colombia, and actually there was no no real threat at all to me. You know, I didn't I didn't feel threatened. I worked a lot in Africa um, when I was in the security industry as well. You know, you know, Somalia, um, Libya, Nigeria, Kenya, Mozambique, Tanzania. I've, I've been to those places. So I understand the cultures and, and the way that, that, that people are. So, but I think with this one, um, you know, when it comes to like social media, it won't be accurate reporting. It'll probably be a few days, uh, oh, here it is. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm going to have to be slightly conscious of that. And, and almost when we're going through lights to South Sudan, you know, don't let anyone, only those that need to know, know. You don't want to be drawing any attention to you. Yeah. Yeah. How big is the support crew then, go on here? So, so this one we're just gonna give me 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 and one guy. Um, the documentary team they will have their own support team with them who will be monitoring the security situation. So someone will be doing that for us, so we can then just focus on the challenge, but also the filming as well. And that's the other good thing as well about um, maybe not not setting yourself a target or an objective because should we get to somewhere in Sudan or Uganda and the, the the documentary team want to do some filming. You know, I'm not tapping my watch, <laughs> you know what I mean, and, and paddling down the river. You know, we've got that flexibility that we can we can, uh, we can can do some recording as well. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's another reason. Do you not reckon your competitive side is going to kick in there? And you're going to just want, when you get on the water, you're going to want to try and crack it? As oh, yeah, fast I, as you can. I will. I will, yeah, yeah. But I know that, I know that you'll sort of know the days that you, you, you can crack it and go for it. You know, there's a lot of the Nile, which is going to be, you know, I think they're reckoning about 90% of the Nile is quite flat. So there's a lot of opportunities to, you know, to get some, some good, good, uh, good distance. And there's going to be areas where it's just so remote, there's nothing there. You know, the Sud in South Sudan is the swamplands. It's about, it's about three weeks paddling. Um, and it's just all rivers. And you end up living on the, uh, on the reeds. You make little islands and, and live on oh, really? Yeah, yeah. So that it's going to be great, great footage as well. And you know, also the great thing about this one is that I'm going to be relying on that local knowledge, um, especially fishermen. They're the ones I'm going to be really tapping into because they'll know those rivers. They'll know where the crocs and hippos tend to be <laughs> and tend to tend not to be as well. So that, that's that's the other sort of um, advantage of this challenge as well, which differs from from the other one. The other one we knew there was a road. The road's not going to move, <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and you could almost 
do the majority of the planning back here. Um, whereas this is almost get to the start point with the kit uninjured and then let's just, just, just go for it. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be good that mate. It's going to be good. I went to, I went to Uganda when I was in and, uh, we went to a, a town called Ginger, J I N J A. Yeah. Did let, did let, have you been there? No, no, no. But obviously, as I've been doing the planning, you know, yeah. Ginger, I'm going to have to. Um, we're going to be flying our uh, all the equipment into Ginger. Oh, mate, what a place! Did it? <laughs> did Lev mention it? <laughs> did, Le- did Lev mention it when you talked to him? No, he hasn't. He hasn't mentioned uh, Ginger yeah. specifically. We, we, I did some jungle training the other, and uh, we had a couple of days out. But uh, there's a there's a bar on the there's a, <clears throat> there's a bar high up on the bank of the Nile, and. Uh, it's called. It's run by some South Africans, and it's called Adrift. Apparently, it's a chain of bars out there. Adrift, A D R I F T. Yeah. And uh, and the the landlady or the landlady at the time used to cut out in a t-shirt, and she said uh, in the back of the t-shirt, it would say, um, "I'm not. I'm not. I'm not paid. I'm not paid to make you like me. If you don't like it here, fit fit in or fuck off. <laughs> That's the bar stuff. <laughs> and they so you got. You can overlook the balcony, and like not balcony, the not balcony. It's just a typical African bar, yeah. as in, uh, yeah, and outdoor roof of the head. You can look over the veranda, like the veranda, and down at the Nile, and you get the monkeys. You can hear the monkeys sc- scurrying across the roof, and they'll just jump yeah. down at the trees and cross your pull your pint in, so you don't get it. But then, basically, they get you drunk there. You get drunk there, and their other business. Is a uh, bungee jump into the Nile. So you <laughs> you pay you pay you however much money it is to go, and they take you up to the top of the on the top of the crane, or when you do a bungee jump in. So yeah, you'll see that going past there. Just the gin- the gingers where they reckon the source of the Nile starts, isn't it? There's a there's a there's a thing there, but actually it's actually the, re- the original source is is in you know, another uh, two countries back, back down. Yeah, they say the source. Of, yeah, they say the source is ginger. It's, it's a cool place. But um, what was what was going to say to them? Do you with the challenges, mate? Do you what? Do you have? Do you feel a need to keep setting yourself the high bar, setting yourself the challenges to for the for that fulfilment? Yeah. So you know the reason I got into I don't even know the reason I I got into the bike ride. So um, I not long just I obviously worked in the security industry when I left the military. You know um, I got injured out, so I worked in the security industry. Um, what I did realize at the time, and it's only in reflection now looking back, I was trying to match the adrenaline rush I had when I was still in the special forces in the security industry without having to come to terms with the fact that I left. So me, you know, burying weapons on the black market between, um, between, you know, between Tunis and Egypt and evacuating embassies on my own, you know, that for me was, was my high, my adrenaline. Um, and then we soon realized that, you know, you know, um, chapter 16 in the book's called Dead or Divorced. And my wife's like, ah, you know, something needs to change. So my wife's a property developer and, you know, started doing property development there. But you can imagine, you know, with my backstory, I wasn't really interested in, in that sort of line of work. So I just wanted to do something to, to challenge myself, you know, but physically and mentally, but not taking those risks of smuggling people across borders and burying weapons and stuff. So, um, so that's why we did the bike ride. But we never looked at it beyond that. You know, I mean, when we're not finished it, because it was such a success that, you know, you smashed the two world records, you raised over £900,000 in mental health. We didn't see it as a career in guest speaking, books and future challenges. Um, so it was almost like I needed to fill it with something. Um, I know I, I know that I don't, but, you know, I think the military guys are very similar. And, and same with a lot of these entrepreneurs. They need something, they need an objective or a goal. Um, whether it's a big challenge or even where it's a short-term challenge, you need something to to, to go for. So, so I have a few you know, short-term challenges. Talk about the the, the great uh, the great Glen Loop, um, but then it's all focused towards uh, the big one. But I, for me, from a personal perspective, I like to prove people wrong. I like to be the underdog, and that gives me that gives me even more drive, um, you know, to to achieve. And that's something I, I like to do. Hence, why I take sports. You know, it's very easy for me to now go do another bike ride and probably like, that. well, he's, he's going to do it because he's, he's already done one before. It's just taken, taken everything I've learned uh, from my time in the military and in security industry and on the bike ride and then just dropping it into a, another discipline. What do you do when you're not prepping for challenges or doing challenges? 
<laughs> what, do you, what do you do with time now when you can't do anything? How do you uh, keep yourself motivated? Yeah, so we're, we're doing a lot. Um, obviously, training, just keep keeping ticking over. My wife's running the, the, the property businesses, so that's good. I've, I've really enjoyed this uh, lockdown period, just, just time with the family, which I, I very rarely have. You know, the year, you know, when I sat down with my wife after about creating the Canadian embassy I'd only been home 21 days in a 365 day calendar I was literally out the door all the time because I was trying to you know get myself in a position to be the best that I could be in the security industry and, and something was neglected and it was that family time so I've really uh, really enjoyed this period now um, doing that but working on stuff in the background is actually as you know now with virtual calls and things like that you're not actually limited <laughs> um, so you know, we're working on new websites, uh, setting up another security company because the, the, the feedback from the book was, why are you not in the security industry? You're the security guru. And so for me to be able to fund my hobbies, as my wife says it, um, I need to be um, you know, bringing, in, bringing in some business as well. Um, so that, that's the sort of plan. So I'm setting up another security company, you know, still do the challenges. I just like busy. Um, I've already got bored. Did, did you have a, comp- a security company before, did you? Yeah, yeah, I had a security, I had a security company before, yeah. I had, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, so when I left, when I left the military, um, when I got injured out, um, I, you know, I, a lot of the guys from, from Paul went over to the UAE and were training up, you know, UAE, there was a job there, but, but for me, I, I, I didn't really want to, I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to get into maritime security because I didn't want to start competing with the guys that I, I, I was, I'd, um, I'd work with down there. But actually, the best thing I did is I moved to Aberdeen from Paul. I disconnected completely from that military uh, environment. I think that's a, a key thing when people leave as well. They almost they still got one foot in the door. You know what I mean? It's like you cut them ties completely. So I, I decided to do ad hoc. You know, I, I didn't want to do contracts, you know, do rotations and things. I just wanted to get gain experience. So literally, I was the, the go-to uh, guy for phone calls, especially for the likes of Africa. Um, but within 48 hours, I was out in Libya helping set up the uh, DFID project with the British Embassy. And that's when I soon realized that, um, you know, trying to find a niche that these larger security companies were charging six-figure sums for crisis management, which weren't actually in place. So um, I yeah, bought 30 weapons on the black market and buried them between Tunis and Egypt and just made my own evacuation plans. And that's what I did. I then just set up a company company from that. You know, initially you get out and you think, oh, you're going to need, need a lot of money. You're going to need manpower and things like that. But the security industry is very much um, a lot of guys um, uh, on a ad hoc, ad hoc. And if you need 20 guys, you can get 20 guys. Um, you know, in my book, I had to, I met the prime minister of Libya and I needed, a, I needed 150 guys, 50 tier one and 70 tier two. I made it happen. Um, uh, you know, oh my God. so you, 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 you can do it. So whether your security company is a one man band or whether it's in a multi-billion pound organization, but actually the quality is, is different. You know, you know, I won't name the, the company, but a lot, one of the largest security companies in the world. You know, two of them actually. I sold my evacuation plan to them in Libya because they had nothing in place, and these were multi-billion-pound industries. So, yes, you're the biggest. Yes, you've got all these certificates and accreditations, but actually, the, the guys that are delivering, it seems to be the same same faces. But it's because so I, I set up a security company years ago, and um, and it, we folded it because, as you well know, you've got to throw your time at it. The security industry is cutthroat industry. It's saturated with competition. It's really difficult to find your niche, which you've got through your background and your experience, right? Brilliant. But the prop the problem with those th- those those big security companies and not and the not so big security companies who operate in the hostile environment end of the market. Yeah. Because it's very rare for stuff to go wrong. Yeah. They pay lip service to a shed load of stuff. And I, I did four years in Iraq on the circuit. Right. Uh, it, I mean, it just beggars belief. What is what is not in place? And you think yeah. if the clients knew about this, they'd be horrified. Yeah. But but also, but also, I experienced, especially with the oil companies concerned, the clients actually didn't. They weren't that interested. Sometimes, if if it meant they were going to save a shed load of money, going yeah. with what appears to be a big company who's charging much less 
Mm. Here's another big company who's got a better reputation, but they're charging much more because of the, because of the costs associated. They go with a cheaper one and just and just and just hedge their bets that nothing's going to happen. When it goes Pete Tong, yeah. <laughs> Well, and that was the situation with this. You know, the you know, when again, I named the companies. These companies were were charging the clients for retainers for these crisis management and things in place, but they didn't have it, and then they absolutely flat. So they then came to me, a one man band, who just you know. So I, I, I get it, but the thing is, <clears throat> what I've understood in the security industry, it doesn't matter whatever security company you Google, they all offer the same services. They're all ex special forces, and and they probably are, but it's probably someone sat on the board somewhere. Whereas what I like to do is I, you know, the guys on the ground will be tier one and tier two operators. That's it. You know I mean? I, you, you get what you pay for. You pay a little bit more, but you get, you get what you get. Um, you get, you get the service. And, that, and that's the problem. You know, all these websites, they all offer the same services, but all they're doing is just calling the same people. I used to get a, say, I used to get a phone call from one of the companies saying, oh, what's your availability in the next two weeks to such and such country? I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm free. And I'd get the same phone call from two other companies because they're all, the big companies are bidding. It's almost like, well, miss, let's go out of the way and let me just go direct to the client because it will be me at the end of the day or a select few who will be delivering the, uh, <laughs> delivering the work as well. So, um, but as you know, with the security industry, um, this is where I'm sort of changing things uh, this time round is, it's not risk reward ratio balanced at all. You know, what I mean, I, I could be in Yemen on Somalia or Libya on fifty percent of what I'd be on on a UAE Royal Family Super Yacht or working with Visa at the World Cup in in Rio in five star hotels. You know, what I mean, you're on twice as much money. So my my sort of my target now is to work. You know, I, I've done that, but I'm you know very no. Yes, should there be another situation where someone needs help, then I would go out and do it, but sort of working with those ultra high net worth um, sort of clients as, as well because yeah you know I think they're just being being robbed by some of these other security companies who actually as you said they don't have those um, procedures in place until it's too late no it's also not the procedures they pay lip service to the people they're employing and no the service to the people I mean the, the people who listen to this yeah they, they know the score as in people I've worked with I mean you look at the uh, the classic is um, employing locals like employing locals to be a security operator, that's the classic. And I was out in Iraq in Basra when all the dramas hit in Ramallah Royal Field. Yeah. When all the locals all the locals rebelled against the the big security one of the big security companies. And it was a, well, you know, or you probably know about it if you were, yeah. if you read about it, domino effect and we were locked yeah. up. There was mates of mine who were held hostage. You know, when you ever know, yeah? British people held hostage in a camp in Iraq. By the own the only people the only own people that, yeah. that the security company are employing and Muggins here was out um, yeah. stuck on a site for flipping five days mm-hmm. managing security for a site I, I wasn't doing anything grand managing yeah. security site surrounded by locals. <laughs> but that's the other thing as well is that when I when I get guys in you know they they're on a good wage because you know I mean you want you want to retain them you, you know if you're paying them a good wage they're not going to start looking elsewhere they'll come to you and, and actually. You're still matching what the other companies are paying, but they're making such huge overheads. Uh, whereas I actually don't need it. I'd rather give guys give guys work. But you've also touched on this there is about using locals. You know, like I remember one of the uh, one of the security companies in Libya. Um, their clients didn't want to pay for the tier one you know, uh, concept. This was when things were, were getting a, a lot better. So I trained up a load of locals in, in close protection, which was sponsored by this security company. But security company didn't uh, sign any sort of uh, paper with them, so they all left and set up their own company. Oh. <laughs> so oh it's my God. by me, because I now use those local Libyans as, uh, as well, because that's the thing. And again, when I, you know, this is where a lot of security companies get it wrong as well. And this, I think this is where I've been quite successful in the security industry is that um, I understand the demographics and the politics in the regions, the tribal influences, whereas a lot of securities come in, go in heavy handed and think they're going to bully their way around. You know, when I, the, um, um, the week before I took the Canadian embassy out, the, Amer- uh, the British embassy left and got shot at every checkpoint in Libya. Um, and that's purely because of their arrogance. Uh, they just drove through all the checkpoints. So I went out and spoke to all the tribal elders and it was actually all about communication and they just, 
waved us through um, the week after. Uh, but I would go out to Somalia or Yemen and I'd sit down with clients and sit down, have food on the floor with them and their families. And, you know, and you being there, you being present there is so much more impactful than someone or some security company in London or New York saying, oh, we offer these services. This is our daily rate. Whereas actually you've taken the risk to go out there understood the actual atmospherics and realized actually you don't need all this security you just need this 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 and this and I think that's where I was quite successful in, in that in that aspect I looked at it uh, from a different angle a different approach basically yeah it's interesting you mentioned about um, about paying your paying your, paying your guys or girls at a decent wage and and I did the same I did is what it was one of the it was one of the sort of found the basic principles that Myself and business partner said at the start we, when we started that company, that was a failure. I'm not saying it was like I know everything. I'm just yeah, saying no, a we, lot of them are, though. A lot of them do. And, and you know, you speak to a lot of these these entrepreneurs. And this is this, sorry, jump in, but this is what this is what gets me. You go to some of these career transition workshops with the military, and they'll bring in all these success stories. And I'm like, that, that's fine, but I want to know how you got there. What, what failings were exactly. They probably had two other companies that failed, but succeeded on the third. So, yeah, they, you know, it's just learning from your mistakes. Yeah, yeah. I, I, going, going back, um, the point I was going to make was that we said the same thing. Like, if we pay them what we can afford to pay them, not, yeah. not like, and, and that means if that means we can afford more, and yeah. our margin is this, but we pay them more. The margin because the point, the point about it was, is like, and which, which I'd learned from being overseas, working overseas in private security, is that. The security companies, they put a lot of effort into their into making the customer feel happy, their yeah. reputation with the customer's concerned. Yeah. Very little into what the what their employees think of them. Yeah. And when you've got a problem, an empl- when you when you treat employees like rubbish, and this and this goes back to that business thing in general, you treat employees like rubbish, right? Especially in a in an industry where it's a high turnover rate, you're constantly having to recruit constantly recruit and it's and it's got to be decent people because of what you're doing if your employees think you're a dickhead and they disappear then your reputation <laughs> employees is crap and the standard of what you're able to provide the customer goes down the pan you can't get the people and that's where you end up with lunatics doing crazy stuff but that's, that's where so many big companies come in and like i said because they're so big they can they'll, they'll win on the proposal they'll undercut everyone else but then they'll get guys in and you know you're not going to get the same service and always Always say that, but that job I was talking about with the prime minister, it's, it's in the book actually. It was one of our first. <clears throat> it was one of our first jobs. We wanted because I had another security company, and as you know, with the daily rates, the guys that were out there with me were on twelve hundred a day, and the guys on standby in the UK were on six hundred a day. It was like double the rate. US, US. No, no, UK. Oh, sweet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was huge. But the problem we then had that, after that is the fact that. You know, because I needed 150 guys, and I got all the guys in. We had guys on standby on 600 pound a day in UK. Guys that came out were on 1200, which is all like, you know, maybe three or four times the, the going rate. Is that when that job, you know, sort of finished, or you know, we, we pushed it aside in the end? Is that you know they, they expected that all the time? I was like, hang on, that was a that was a one off. You know, we you know, yeah. we, you know, because of the importance of the job, you know, we 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 could give that, but uh, yeah, it didn't help us moving forward because <laughs> everyone expected those daily rates. I was like, hang on. But, yeah, but that's just naivety on their part, isn't it? It's you know, um, I got a. Uh, yeah, that's a business challenge, and and especially when you deal with ex-military guys, <laughs> you can't get, they're flipping, they can be they can be vicious. I've got a friend who uh, I won't name him. He's ex-military. He runs a company. It's not a security company. And when COVID hit, he had to um, he they, he had to he had to furlough his employees. And there's a bunch of oh yeah, he had to furlough everyone. I think, and there were some people who couldn't furlough because they weren't they weren't contracted. They were they were set on a self employed basis, right? <clears throat> and uh, they were kicking off at him day by day by day because the veterans, a lot of the veterans were, uh, yeah. because because he's a veteran, so they immediately you can you we we communicate differently to as if he was just some other bog standard MD, right? But they were kicking off because they weren't getting paid, 
you need to pay me. It's like, <laughs> I haven't got, how? I, I, like, and he felt bad about it. It's like, how? They just they don't understand. They just don't, they're just blinded to it. What do you want to pay you with? Peanuts. I'm not getting any money from any contract. Mad. Right. Mad. Well, I think, you know, that's the luxury we have when we're in the military. And I think this period now is great for retaining people in the military because they're going to be thinking twice. Anyone who's thinking about getting out is like, hang on, my job's secure here. You know, I'm getting paid regardless of the situation. But it, like you said, when you get out, they think it's the same. It is two totally different different worlds. Um, you know, you need to you need to earn your money. You need to work for it. You need to try and find it. You know, it's it's a, it's a different approach. The problem is when you leave. Funny, uh, this this thought came. Up, I sent you earlier. I randomly ended up the call with Mercer and Dave Richmond and the OBA. Yeah, earlier. Yeah. Randomly, I was in the bath when I got a text saying, "Ah, it's a call going on. <laughs> really? Jump on it." And uh, and it, it was about transition. And just prompting some thoughts. It's like when when we when we were, when we were in and we transitioned the civic streets, or, or we're transitioning the civic street. The civilian world is as alien to us yeah. as the military world was when we were day one in depot. Yeah, it's, yeah. We don't understand the intricacies any, any of it anymore. And especially if you joined up, you're 16, 17, 18, never had a proper job, like a proper job. Yeah. Never spent any time in it. And and so you get out, you go, you just don't understand it. But what happens is. You leave on the day, so you have your, you have your, maybe you have a, like a transition period when you're in six mm. months resettlement and all that rubbish, yeah. right? Which is just, a, yeah, which is fine. I mean, it's fine and it's been an experience, but the fact of the matter is, you still have an experience every street. So when your pay stops right. and maybe you lose your quarter mm. um, and and you're out, you're still at the point where you don't, you've not experienced the civilian world as an adult, but no. you're under pressure to get a job. Yeah. financially, emotionally under pressure to get a job because you need fulfillment. At the same point as you don't understand your value, you don't yeah. understand how to translate it into the civilian world, and you don't understand how it fucking works, where you can go for employment, yeah. where you can go for support, but you're there on your ass. It's like, Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, yeah. I, yeah I, I talk a lot about that as well, is, is that, you know, because I, I was the same, I was under pressure. My wife was eight months pregnant when I left the camp. You know, within 48 hours, I was, I was working in Libya. But, you know, you're supposed to have that gardening leave for six weeks. I was like, no, sod that. I'm straight out working and and, and getting money. You know, I don't work for you anymore. But I was guilty of it myself. You know, when I left, I was like, fucking civvies, they don't understand. They're always late, blah, 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 blah. You know, just blame. I was very quick to blame someone else and that being the civilian community. When, in fact, you know, there's nothing wrong with the civilian community. We're the ones that are unique and we need to fit into their world, not them fit into ours. And I think a lot of guys and girls struggle with that. The sooner you realise that you need to fit into their world, it becomes a lot easier. Um, it's those that that, that that don't appreciate that that, that, that tend to have issues at the start. But then also the way you conduct yourself, you know, we're, we're great in the military. You know, it's all about um, you know, the way you look and things like that. You're always smartly dressed and things like that. But also your your mannerisms. You know, I know when I can be stotty, stotty, stot, stotty the general, what, the five nine stot, you know. I and mean, then I know when I'm Mr. Dean stot, civilian, you know what I mean? I don't take that into, you know, you know, you know, you know, one of the, I, I love my humour. I love the, the humour in the military. It's very dark and it's, it's dry and things like that. You know, I'd, I'd love to sometimes when I'm sat in these meetings do a lovely little one-liner. But I know it will just drop like a sack of potatoes. Um, but again, some guys and girls struggle when they get out. They think civilians have the same sense of humour as we do. Like, oh, they don't. You know what I mean? It's a, it's a different approach. It's, very, it's a lot more PC, uh, as we know. And I think some people will struggle there. They just don't know when to tone it down. Um, Mate, I've dropped, I've dropped two absolute clangers, clangers, <laughs> and uh, a absolute clangers. And one was at work, and what as, as the humour side of it, right? Yeah, yeah. And one was at work, and one was in a social environment. I'll tell you, right? I'll tell you because, and this is, I left in 2011, and these have happened recently, right? oh, really? like last last oh, year yeah. or so. Because, and it, it's like drink involved, but this you get this. I think you get this. I got just into rapport, and there was an ex-military per uh, this one situation at work, right? And I was we, we there was gags being told, but I'm s- with directors. I'm not directing, right? Yeah, I'm yeah. stood with directors. And the only reason I stood with directors talking is because one of them is ex-military. I know him really well, right? Yeah. And uh, we, we're all this circle, male and female. And I told this joke. I won't tell the joke, right? But it start. I had to start it off with the caveat. 
Does anyone have any disabled family? I said that. I wanted to check first. Don't that straight away. That the fact that I asked that question is not a joke. Should we tell him in yeah, a circle yeah, yeah. of like executives? No way. I told the joke, mate. No one laughed. <laughs> Jesus oh, Christ. It, and then, ah, oh, honest to God, he just looked at me. And then, and then the the director was ex-military and a mate. He started laughing. Did you get it? And then I was like, Jesus. I woke up the next morning thinking, what was I thinking? Yeah. And then the other one was, uh, but I was just in that, you can tell any joke, any humor goes thing in my head. And the other one was, um, it, uh, especially it, if I did it now, Jesus Christ, with the BLM movement going on. I was in a pub. And um, and, and I, I think it happened because I'd been talking about the, the, the equality and the, the lack of care about what your background or what your skin color is when you're serving. Right. right, which is the ninety nine point nine percent of the case, right? Yeah. And I'd be talking about it on the podcast, I think. Anyway, that evening I'm out on the piss and I'm in a I'm in an event and everyone and I, and I offer to take this photo for someone's birthday party. Everyone gets into the photo in a pub, right? Not privately hired, there's like normal people there as well. And all these people are civvies at this birthday party, but we have just basically crashed. Everyone gets into the photo and there's a person on the end of the photo who's who's not white, as in on the on the outside of the photo is not white. And I said, Everybody ready? I'm just checking we've got the token. Like, and I was joking. Like, yeah, yeah. I was roaring, mate. I said it and I was roaring with laughter. Yeah. No, but I was, I was lashed. And I, again, in my head, it was, if I, now, the thing with that came in, right? I, I next day in my arrogance, I thought, oh, it's just fucking dickheads. <laughs> because the missus got a load of stick for it because she knew the people and they were, people were getting called racist. She was getting called racist. I was getting called racist, but I didn't know about it. I said to her, it's like, Jesus, I was just running and arrogant. They've just, oh, they just can't take a joke. Yeah, all right, blah, blah, blah. But I thought about it a lot since. It's like, man, I didn't know that guy. I didn't know that guy who said it about, right? The problem is I went into, I was acting as if I did know him. I was acting as if it was one of the, one of the, the black people like I knew in my circle of friends in the military who we used to slag each other off to do with race on a daily basis. It meant nothing. Now, the problem is I did that to someone I didn't know. And I know... Over the last few months, because I thought about it a lot, I'm really embarrassed by it because, man, it could actually have had a really bad impact on him. Like, I don't know what his upbringing was. He could have felt really embarrassed. He could have felt really self conscious for the rest of that evening, the next day, because I'd highlight the fact that he was a black guy. I made this, this joke about the old, you know, token that all the cartoons and all the stuff you see, the South Park and all that have done it. We couldn't get away with it now. Yeah. Completely, completely forgot myself. And I'm really embarrassed at the end of it now, but it's that. Getting away from your military stuff is really hard. The thing really is, hard. the military, like you said, you, you know, when you do jokes in, in the public, in the civilian sector, you don't know them. So you don't know what their levels are. At least in the military, you live with these people. So you know, you know, you know, you know what you can and can't say, you know, um, and things like that. So, so yeah, it's, it's a difficult one. But, but no, I've seen it again with guys, some of the guys, and they're talking to the clients and like, ah, yeah, you know, I mean, it's just like something should be said and something shouldn't be said. So, I think that's where I say again that where I was quite successful. I knew, I knew when I could be dean stop military, uh, and then when I could be, you know, what I mean, just yeah, being, so. it, is, it is incredibly challenging, incredibly challenging. <laughs> um, yeah, man. Do you? Uh, so you said you're on the phone to Mercer earlier. Was it? Was it? I was on the phone, a Zoom call. It was me, but it wasn't just me and him. Me plus 40 odd, 40 odd others. That was it. I took Johnny Mercer on his commando course. I was his instructor on his all arms. Did you really? Yeah, it was a young <laughs> Sprog second lieutenant. <laughs> I didn't know him when he was in. I didn't, I was, I was yeah, in. Yeah. No, no, no. Uh, yeah. He's a mate, do you know what? I, 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 don't, I don't monitor enough of what goes on in politics, what people do, what they what they're doing well, what they're doing not, and you don't because you only get half the story anyway. Unless you're there with the guy or the girl who's the MP constantly, you just don't you don't understand. But he's he came on the podcast early on, um, and he was he, he's, he's just he's just an honest. He just seemed to me like an honest dude, you know. He is, you know, he's an honest lad, and and, and you know he's, he's doing great things with the veterans as well, which which is good. You know, he's, he's a voice um, which we, which which we need, but. Um, yeah, I don't really remember him. Although I took him, I, he was a young second lieutenant, so he was probably hiding, you know, not trying to get my attention. <laughs> but no, he, he didn't. He didn't stand out. But he's, um, yeah, he's a nice guy. He's doing a lot. Which is yeah, good. yeah, it's good. I mean, the thing is, you're going to get stick in that first post, him being in the first in the first position. <coughs> and his politics anyway, ever get stick anyway. But it's, uh, I, I do think that from, 
uh, veterans, ex-military in general. I th- I do think that in in general, mate, we've just in a really good position. I I mm. think that. Uh, I also think that uh, it seemed to me like on, on the call earlier. It seemed to me like that they or David Richmond certainly seemed to appear as if this perception. He worried that this perception of veterans as people who have got who are who, who what's the word have got they're not that capable and need help with stuff yeah, right? yeah. that happens that he seemed to think that happens that perception <clears throat> is like massive i think it's a minority the yeah. minority of people think that you know yeah. it, it's um and and the, most most of us are capable right? and i think that's evidence in the fact that companies are are trying to ex- expose themselves more to, to the veteran community yeah. because our benefits are becoming more aware because of things like Office of Veterans Affairs and charity work and stuff like that. I, 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 people like yourself, just success stories are out there and just yeah. being good good representatives of the of, of the veteran community and not flipping whinge in every two seconds. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, I think you're right there. I don't, I think, yeah, you're right. There's only a very small minority. There's those <clears throat> that think they're entitled. You're like, no, again, you need to, you know, you know, you, your military is your military. You know, I love the military. I, I love the military so much because it gives you so many skill sets, you know, so many transferable skill sets, which we take for granted. But that's that's your military. Leave it there. You know, you go and then set up on, the, on your second career. But there's the amount of people sort of rest on those laurels and feel like they're entitled. And you're like, no, you, you know, you've got to leave that at the camp gate. You're on your own now or, or set up a business with friends, whatever, you know. You know, you haven't got that top cover of the QM or the CO or whatever, you know, looking after you. I can see where the entitlement comes from and, yeah. and the sense of entitlement. And I had it when I left, you know, yeah. thought the illusion of the grandeur going to certain positions and, and yeah. gee, shoot. You're right. No, 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 sorry. No, 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 no. I'm just checking. Oh. My, uh, no, I've got a, <laughs> like a bloody something growing on my arm. <laughs> oh. I, I understand it, the, the sense of entitlement, because we're built up to be to think we're the flipping best in the world, right? And um, but the, the sense of entitlement, I think, doesn't come from the the any negative character traits of that individual who thinks that. It's again, it's from that lack of understanding of the civilian world. They just don't understand it, they, yeah. and it's they don't understand their perception of us. They don't understand in reality where you can fit into the picture, and um, and it's not to do with a service, you know. It, it it's a it's a shame, but that, that's where I think that's where you were saying it, it, it's it, it's where we can fit into the civilian world and, and not the opposite. Like yeah. we are the odd one now. It's a really good. You put it a really good way. I've not heard it expressed like that before. Um, but then yeah. you get the other you get the other side of things is you get you get the people who are set of entitlement, and you get the the people who the people who think they're hard done by, yeah. right? And then and then just go mental about it, hard yeah. constantly, and it just doesn't the worst. I've experienced it several times, and you, I'm. Um, I'm trying to think of an example. What were you going to say then? You're going to no, no, no. I was, I was, I was going to say the um, you know the military can do a lot more though with, when we when we're transitioning. I like say well, you, know, you, get, you get taught about CVs and interview techniques. Well, I've never written a CV and I have never had an interview. But for me, it's like who do I speak to in the council about my council tax? You know, it's things that um, the civilian will take for granted, which they know that we don't know. You know, the military is great in the fact that they keep all those distractions from you, but they need to start reintroducing them earlier. Um, I think they're the sort of skill sets or, or information I would have liked when I left um, with that. But I, I was, you know, I was very, you know, I'm very quite honest. I'm, you know, I, I see people's transitions. Some can be quite smooth and some quite turbulent. You know what I mean? Mine was very smooth because my wife was very entrepreneurial. She dealt with all that. She knew who we had to speak to and sell. Set my security company on a BlackBerry watching EastEnders. You know what I mean? For me, it's like whether I've ticked the right box in the company. <laughs> so, so, you know, I was very fortunate uh, because of that. And I understand that not not all people um, are, are fortunate for that and they do struggle. But and I think that's where the military could help a bit more is like, you know, just give them and also follow up. You get follow up call a year later, don't you? Like, yeah, cheers. <laughs> yeah, what, 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 one of the things I suggested on. Um, on that call was could there should there be a tapering off of mm. let me just shut this let me just shut this curtain two seconds oh, no.
we'll uh, we'll start we'll start we'll start knocking it on the head a minute. No, 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 we um it was the suggestion that the the that CTP support and RCMO, you know, careers management support that you get when you're in, and even that financial support that you get when that turns off when you like turns off straight away when you leave. Could that not be tapered off? I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, but could it not be tapered off? So mm-hmm. as your as your knowledge of the civilian world increases, like you're saying, mate, like rent, <laughs> like council tax, utility bills, this stuff we don't have to deal with ever, mm-hmm. right? Exactly. Ever. Uh, Can we taper off that support instead of stopping dead? So over six months, it'll go from like let's take your money for example. Yeah, mm-hmm. you get you know, and your first month out, your pay drops by fifteen percent. Second month, it's thirty percent down, mm-hmm. and then uh, six months, seven months later, then it stops. And as you're as you are more likely to get a job that's going to meet your financial and emotional needs, yeah, you've you. As you learn that, you've, you've not had, sorry, you, as the time goes on, you're going to learn that stuff that can get you the job you want to get or yeah. a job that you're going to be happy with and support you, as opposed to Oops. thinking, yeah. flipping pay stops. Yeah. You go, I got to get a job. And you end up in some job that you're not suited to, you don't understand the role, maybe it's not meeting your needs. And just, you start off on the wrong foot. And the same with the uh, career stuff and the CTP yeah. site. Taper off the support, keep it in place mm. so they can, like, when I left, I didn't know the ring. Yeah, I didn't yeah. know. You know, I I was very lucky. I'm a CTP officer. Um, I was able to. I I was able to. I had a number. I was able to call her, and she was really helpful to me for a number of years. Like just okay. call her for advice. She wasn't. She didn't have to do that. Yeah. And I was in a really good position. Other people don't have that. You know. It's um. And again, yeah. you get out. You don't. We don't understand. Yeah. Like the the amount you know now and I know now about. There's literally shouldn't yeah. be a problem that you or I ever have that it cannot. Get support from it. This is everything can be supported, either from military, charities, religious organizations, your old unit, or existing synth pop stuff. It's just there, it's all there, but we don't know where we get out. I don't know. But there's an, there's, I'm working with a team called Positive Transition, and they're, they're working on a, an online concept. So you'll transition from two years out, um, but you basically, for example, where, where you live, you, you'd say, Right, I'm going to live in Chelmsford. They'll get someone from the local council who's an army champion. Or military champion, and then they'll they'll talk everything through you about schools, council tax, things like that. But if you can't do it, your spouse can also do it as well, and it's all online um, as well. And What's it's it called? What's called it called? Positive transition. Is that is it still starting up, or is it is it in, is it yeah, operating yeah, now? It's just, it's just starting up. It is. I think mean, they're just starting to make inroads with Johnny and a few of the others. Yeah, um, it's, it's just starting up. Yeah, but it's um, yeah, it's a great great concept actually. Um, but you start from two years out, and then you literally, I mean, it, it, it flags up. If, you, if you're if you late or you need to catch up on things, it, it flags up to your, your unit as well. So they, they're under pressure as well to assist you with that as well. It's quite good. What do you mean it starts from your two years out? So, so you know, it, it should. it's more for those who come to, you know, it works for everyone. But if you're coming towards your 22 year, you can ah. start, you can start transitioning, you know, then. But obviously there's cases like, I don't know, I was injured, you know, get it get it fast tracked um but there's just loads of things that you, you you can go on there and but it's just things like what we talked about who do i speak to about my council tax and things like that you'll have a a champion from each council um who will deal with uh, veterans leaving um as well so yeah it's, it's quite good yeah they're in the early stages but um I'd be interested to see what happens there but no it's like your rcmo or you know we used to have it in in, in pool you get a guy who's an le officer who's never been a civvy, who's given you advice on corporate. I was like, well, what do you know? Because you, you know, you, you've never been a civvy before in your life. So it's just it's just simple things like that. <laughs> it's just like, right, those positions, I think, those positions where you're dealing with stuff that's civilian oriented, they need to be for, yeah. they need to be someone who's not serving anymore, but in a, but, but still, but still supporting the military. You know, like, yeah. I, I don't know how you explain it, but you've got, um, you know, like a Reggie Kern, not Reggie Kern, a bad example, but in, in the Power Edge Association, um, which the, the the guy who heads that, the secretary of that, who sits permanently in our HQ, well, he was an LE, but he's not now. He's out, but he's he's still there. So and so those people should be the ones who've got a civil experience, like exactly what you're saying, and, and be in those in-unit roles where you talk about transitioning. Like you say, how the fuck do they know about it? Yeah. And plus, it shouldn't, or if it is going to be, that it should be a two-year role. It should be longer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It takes you six, seven months to understand it. 
then you may, may make an impact for maybe a year. And then you, the last six, four, five, six months, you're like looking at where you want to go next. Yeah. That's the way, that's the way it works. Man, isn't it? Man. Yeah, yeah. yeah everyone, everyone's different. But even things like terminology. You know, people get scared about terminology. And that, J4 is stores. You know, it's, it's this, it's this. It's, you know, it's just relating it. Even that itself, you know, you just need someone to come in and say, right, well, that what that is, is, is that. You know what I mean? It's... um. But it's difficult, you know, it's different because people go to so many diverse backgrounds. I, I love this hearing stories. You know, I went to security, you went to security, but you no, know, people have gone other ways, you know what I mean? Just sort of taking a leap, I'm going to go go do this, you know, I like that. Yeah, I mean, well, one of the problems with the circuit is you don't get any, I try and say it to people, when you go out, go out to Iraq or whatever, if, you, if you're going to do it, get, save some money, but... Yeah. If don't think don't don't get yourself stuck in that rut because I went out for four years and I had the foresight to when I was coming back and on leave in between my rotations back I would, I would do I would go and do some work or do a course or something keep yeah. your hand in the network the network right yeah but but when I when I eventually managed to transition back to the UK in 2015 it was 2015 we're in 2020 now so 2015 um. And I ended up landing a really good health and safety job, a corporate health and safety manager for a, a not a small company, right? Mm. And, mate, I didn't have a clue. And you all about health and safety, because I done the course, but then try, I didn't understand how companies were made up. I didn't understand HR departments, marketing departments, yeah. the operational side. What is CapEx? What is OpEx? What? What are you talking about? <laughs> didn't understand. I'm still learning now. I'm still learning now. Mad. Mad. Yeah. And as I say, that's why I, when I go back to when I was there and I go guest speaking, I love to come in and just sit on these these meetings these days and just understand what their business is and what they actually do and deliver because yeah, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, there's a lot going on. Yeah, mate, it's been a pleasure talking to you. What's uh, uh, where can people where can people buy the book? Uh, you can buy the book on. Uh, so yeah, we can buy the book. Um, on Amazon uh, or audio, and I think it's on Waterstones at the moment. So yeah, any any good bookshop, as they say. Um, but it's been, you know, it's had it's had great feedback. You know, there's there's many biceps and bullets books, as I call them. But the, the unique one about this is actually there's so many stories that are post military. You know, the private security stuff as well. So that, that that's where it's uh, that's the, the meaty part of the book. And then obviously, you know, the double wheel record at the end. Yeah, it's mega, mate. I'll, I'll have, I've, I've not read it. I have to get a copy of it. Also, there's a striking likeness in the front of that book of you to Gareth Thomas. <laughs> yeah, in fact, yeah, a few people have said. I was thinking that before. I was thinking more Jason Statham, but yeah, no, yeah, Gareth. <laughs> hey, Gareth's a legend. Yeah, no, well, I've actually we were, we had the Sports Person Out of the Year awards here last last year, and we were VIP guests because of obviously the, the bike ride and things like that. And, and he was there. My missus was like double take, and I was like. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. Um, you got a web. You got a website, haven't you? Yeah, we've got a website. Yeah, www.deanstock.com. Um, you know that's going to be it's getting revamped at the moment as well, and then on Instagram and Facebook. Great. Anything else you want to mention? No, just uh, enjoy yourselves and stay safe and keep well. Eh? Yeah, mate. Oh, listen, I appreciate your time and good luck with everything. And if you need anything, give me a shout. I'm sure cool. I can oblige. Yeah, likewise, and, and the other way around. See you for a beer soon in real life, hopefully. Cheers, mate. We will. Take care, buddy. Bye. Cheers, mate. Bye-bye.